All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to workshop 11. This is new therapies for cystic fibrosis. Uh, my name is Tony Fisher, and I'm from the University of Iowa. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist, and I will be moderating this session along with Lucy Parham from SickKids in Toronto, who is also a pediatric pulmonologist. We've witnessed an amazing progress in CF therapies over the past decade. New treatments that activate CFTR can improve outcomes for patients with CF, but this leaves some questions. How do CFTR modulators work in the CF lungs? Can we develop new treatments for rare mutations? And how can we make gene therapy a reality for patients with CF? Today, we have three excellent speakers who will be presenting their um, abstracts. First, we'll have Scott Donaldson from the University of North Carolina, who will talk about triple modulator therapy and how it improves mucociliary clearance. We will have Hillary Valley from CFF Therapeutics, who will talk about exon skipping approaches to helping rare mutations. Uh, for, and lastly, we will have uh, Carlos Gustavo Perez Garcia from Arcturus Therapeutics, who will discuss a new approach to delivering mRNA replacement therapy for CF. We'll start with uh, Dr. Donaldson from the University of North Carolina. Sorry about that. I think I was muted, so I will start over. Um, uh, thanks for the invitation today. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of both myself and my co-PI of this study, Dr. Steve Rowe from UAB, as well as the entire uh, PROMISE study team. Uh, the data I'll be showing, uh, if I can go backwards, it'd be great. Nope. So the data I'll be showing is uh, comes from actually a embedded sub-study within the uh, much larger PROMISE observational study of patients being clinically prescribed uh, alexacaftor, tazacaftor, ivacaftor therapy, or ETI therapy. These are my financial disclosures. So the, the rationale for the study really uh, revolves around this hypothesis that links restoration of CFDR activity to the improvement in clinical outcomes that we see with uh, ETI therapy from clinical trials. And that hypothesis is that as we restore, restore CFDR activity, that should result in measurable improvements in mucus properties that uh, facilitate improved mucus transport. And then as mucus transport improves, that should relieve airways obstruction, uh, improve respiratory symptoms, and ultimately uh, improve quality of life, disease exacerbations, and hopefully survival in these patients. Certainly part of the rationale for wanting to do the study also comes from our prior work using MCC measurements and other uh, CFTR modulator studies. So uh, shown here is uh, some old data uh, from the GOAL study in which patients with the G551D patients were treated with Ivacaptor. So uh, there we go. On the left is a, a pre-treatment video. On the right is a one month post-treatment uh, video. And I think uh, what you can see is that clearly uh, in um, many patients, we saw dramatic improvements in mucosillary clearance uh, after initiation of this highly effective CFTR modulator. In contrast, uh, in patients uh, with two copies of the f 508 del mutation who were treated with Lumicaftor and Ivacaftor in the PROSPECT study, we actually saw no average improvements in mucosillary clearance. So this uh, PROMISE study really gives us the chance to figure out where ETI therapy falls within the spectrum uh, of uh, treatment responses. So a little bit about uh, study design first. So again, a reminder that this is a sub-study within the much larger uh, PROMISE observational study that enrolled 489 patients. I'll just refer you to abstract 283 from Dave Nichols uh, for more details there. In our sub-study, we enrolled 46 patients, uh, and our key procedures were uh, MCC measurements using gamma scintigraphy. Uh, we performed speed of induction, so we could collect mucus for mucus analyses, and we also uh, collected exhaled breath condensate uh, measurements. 
Uh, these procedures were performed pre-treatment and approximately one month after initiating ETI therapy. And it was conducted at four uh, study sites uh, as depicted in, in the uh, figure there. So this was uh, University of North Carolina, UAB, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, in addition, there were a couple of other embedded sub-studies within this embedded study uh, where additional procedures were performed at single sites. Our primary endpoints were twofold. First, the change in mucos mucociliary clearance that we measured. And the second, the change in percent solids and sputum, which is an index of the hydration of mucus. Our secondary and exploratory endpoints included change in sputum macroreology using Conan plate measurements change in EBC sialic acid to urea ratio, which again is a, uh, a marker of mucin concentration in the deep lung, as well as EBC pH. Uh, in our single site uh, uh, measurements, uh, the change in functional microanatomy of the ASL la layer in the nose uh, was, perf was performed using micro OCT uh, by Dr. Rose group at UAB. I'll just refer you to abstract 451 for that work in progress and change in dynamic ventilation imaging using fluorine MRI uh, was performed at our site, uh, directed by Jen Goralski. And again, I'll just refer you to abstracts 411 and 463 for more information on, on that work. So a little bit about uh, the patients in our sub-study. Uh, again, we had 46 patients. You can see there was a fairly wide range of ages, so between, from 12 to 54, uh, a large range in lung function and BMI. But in general, these patients uh, had, on average, fairly uh, mild uh, uh, airways disease, 78% predicted FEV1, and fairly good nutritional status. Um, about 60% of the patients that uh, we enrolled had two copies of F508 DEL, and the vast majority of those patients were already on treatment with two drug CFDR modulator therapy, either Tazacaftor, Ivacaftor, or Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor. The other approximately 40% of patients had one copy of F508 DEL and were not on modulators. Uh, not unexpectedly, uh, in the patients in our sub-study, we did see uh, a large clinical improvement. So on average, a approximately 9% improvement in the FEV1% predicted. Uh, despite the short treatment duration of just a month, uh, we saw a significant and uh, uh, relatively large improvement in BMI. Respiratory symptoms, uh, uh, as indexed by the CFQR respiratory domain, improved markedly, 14.5 uh, points on average. I'll just point out that a four-point change is considered clinically meaningful. And then in the subset of patients for which we have uh, all of the sweat chloride uh, data back, we saw a substantial drop in sweat chloride of 40 millimolar. So this is sort of the uh, money slide, so to speak, uh, where very simply, this is whole lung clearance uh, over time, uh, pre-treatment versus post-treatment. We see a very uh, robust and large improvement in MCC in the uh, 38 patients in whom we have uh, paired data. We can drill down a little bit more into the MCC data. Um, and I'd like to first point out uh, at the bottom of this table is that the CDP ratio and deposition skew, which are indices of how, uh, uh, how the uh, inhaled isotope deposits in the lung was not different in the two visits. This is important because it makes it much easier to interpret the clearance data because changes in deposition could lead to changes in clearance, but we did not uh, observe that uh, in this study. Uh, as you've already seen, whole lung clearance did indeed improve uh, dramatically. And this uh, improvement was seen across all the lung compartments that we looked at, uh, including the central lung, which is enriched with large airways, and the peripheral lung, uh, which is enriched with very small airways, where we saw a doubling of the clearance rate. Like the next turn to the uh, mucus analy analyses that were done, I'd just point out that these are from induced sputum specimens, which were collected, shipped overnight, uh, cold, but not frozen to the UAB uh, site for analyses. Uh, the three panels that you see here are from uh, paired data in 23 patients in whom we had specimens both be before and after treatment. On the far left uh, is percent solids measurements, again, an index of the hydration of mucus. And here we saw a very, very substantial and significant drop in percent solids values, dropping from a median value of about four uh, pre-treatment to two and a half post-treatment. 
in the middle and on the right are shear frequency sweep um, sweeps from cone and plate rheometry. And again, you can see that in these paired data, there's a, a very clear shift in both the elasticity in the middle and the viscosity of sputum on the far right uh, with treatment with ETI. We put all of this data, uh, in addition, put all this data into repeated measures model where we included all of the data that was collected, not just the pairs. And again, this held up very well statistically with clear and significant improvements in uh, uh, solids measurements and rheology. So uh, one of the first questions that you might ask is how does this data uh, from the PROMISE study compare to what we've done in the past? And so the, the graph on the right uh, uh, tries to demonstrate that for you. So again, in the blue is the uh, PROMISE ETI therapy data. Um, in the middle in red is uh, data from the GOAL study, which is Ivacaftor treated patients with the G551D. And on the far right in black, is data from F508 DEL homozygous patients treated with lumicaftor, ivacaftor in the PROSPECT study. And I think as you can see that really the, both the mean response and the distribution of responses in mucociliary clearance were very, very similar between ETI therapy and PROMISE and uh, ivacaftor therapy in the GOAL study. In contrast, we saw no improvement on average in lumicaftor, ivacaftor treated patients in PROSPECT. Obviously, when we have this nice set of data, we want to look for uh, within subject correlations between all of the endpoints. And I'll just uh, 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 cut to the chase, say that really there were no significant correlations noted between any of the clinical outcomes, MCC measurements, or our sputum biomarkers uh, uh, analyzed to date. Our EBC, pH, and sialic acid uh, data are still pending, unfortunately, as a consequence of COVID slowing down our lab a little bit. So in conclusion, uh, I think that this data really does support the hypothesis that ETI therapy improves MCC uh, by altering mucus properties, in particular mucus hydration, which we saw from the percent solids measurements, but potentially other mechanisms as well. And it's likely that, uh, that these improvements are responsible for the profound clinical improvements in lung health that have been observed. I think very importantly also these data uh, of these selected endpoints set a benchmark for future therapies that will target CFTR therapy or other elements of the MCC apparatus. So I'd like to end by acknowledging a lot of people who worked very hard on this study, uh, uh, including the TDN Coordinating Center uh, and the overall PIs of the PROMISE study, Dave Nichols and Steve Rowe. I'd like to thank the uh, MCC experts at the four sites that I mentioned, as well as the uh, site PIs who are uh, in charge of oversight and enrolling patients. As always, nothing happens without uh, the excellent research coordinators uh, who fill these studies, take care of the patients, and uh, collect the great data, and they're acknowledged there. I'd like to thank Bill Bennett uh, and his team uh, for serving uh, uh, as the MCC analysis lab where all the uh, data was uh, performed central in the central fashion. Steve Rowe and Evan Boitet uh, at UAB for the mucus rheology lab. Uh, Chuck Esther for doing our EBC analyses at UNC. And then uh, a team effort uh, between Agat Sepp and Lloyd Everett uh, Edwards uh, who uh, provided biostatistical support uh, for the study. And of course, thanks to all the patients and families who participated. All right, thank you very much. We have a, a few questions. Uh, first question, it, it looked like both the treatment and baseline measurements uh, seem to have better clearance at 90 minutes compared to your previous publication in JCI Insight. Is this better baseline uh, mucociliary clearance because they were on tesacaftor, ivacaftor at baseline or because they had better starting lung function? You know, uh, it's a great question and, and it's a, a great observation. It's absolutely true that the baseline measures of uh, clearance in, in this study was faster uh, than what, what we observed uh, uh, in, in prior studies. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a good answer why. Uh, it's a great hypothesis that it was because many of these patients were on two drug modulator therapy. But as I pointed out previously, at least over one or three months, we have not seen improvements uh, with two drug therapy. So it's uh, 
hard for me to, uh, to explain it in that fashion. Patients did have improved, uh, generally better lung function in this study, uh, but we haven't seen uh, correlations between baseline lung function and MC MCC rates previously. So unfortunately, I'm uh, stuck without a great answer for why those baselines were a bit better in the study. Um, a uh, second question here is, uh, uh, I, I think you had addressed, was sputum pH measured uh, or, you're, or are you still uh, addressing that one in the lab? We, we, we did not make uh, sputum pH measurements. We do plan on making measurements of pH in the exhaled breath condensate. That hasn't been done yet. Okay. And then uh, uh, another question, when compared um, to healthy controls, um, how fast are the radio-labeled materials cleared from the lungs? Uh, that, that's another uh, great question and a difficult one to answer. Uh, I really hesitate uh, to make between, uh, between group comparisons of MCC because of some of the technical aspects. Um, we know in patients who have underlying obstructive lung disease, we tend to put more particles into the central airways, and that gives sort of a falsely accelerated uh, appearance of clearance in patients with airways diseases. So, uh, in fact, you know, some of these patients may actually look uh, 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 significantly faster than healthy, but uh, I do think that that really results from just the differences in patterns of where the isotope goes and how it deposits in patients with airways disease. So, while you might see differences in patterns of clearance. I really hesitate to make direct uh, comparisons uh, be about uh, rates of clearance between two, for two different groups. We really like to use this assay uh, in sort of paired measurements before, after types of measurements, uh, because that's just uh, by far the most, uh, the best way to interpret the data. All right, and, and uh, last question here. Are you, are you surprised at all that the deposition of the particle didn't become more peripheral with the- No, it's a, that, no that's another great question. Um, yeah, you might expect with improvement in FEV1 that you might start to see uh, changes in deposition. So I think that uh, would, would have been a reasonable hypothesis that you might see uh, changes in deposition, but we didn't see it in, the, in, in this case. Oh, all right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and now we'll have uh, Dr. Valley um, from CFF Therapeutics discuss her work on exon skipping. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hillary Valley. I'm a scientist at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CFFT Lab. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work today. And I'm excited to tell you about some of the work that we've done at the CFFT lab on um, exon skipping as a potential therapeutic strategy for CF. Let's see, Oop. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So as we all know, therapies targeting CFTR, PTC and other rare mutations is a serious medical need. There are approved therapeutics for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that involve exon 23 skipping, and exon skipping as a paradigm is gaining momentum in other diseases as well. Given the sequence and structure of CFTR, we wanted to evaluate exon skipping for CFTR exon 23 or exon 24. Both CFTR exons 23 and 24 encode portions of CFTR nucleotide binding domain 2, or NBD2. The CF-causing CFTR mutation 1282X is located in exon 23, while the N1303K mutation is located in exon 24. We wanted to test whether removal of the exon containing the CF-causing CFTR mutation would result in a partially functional and or more correctable CFTR protein. It's important to note that clinically, exon skipping has been achieved with antisense oligonucleotides, also known as ASOs. Here we used a genomic editing approach to achieve very high levels of exon skipping, and this was done as a proof of concept to evaluate the potential maximum therapeutic benefit of exon skipping. So first I'm going to start by talking about exon 23 skipping. The approach here was to target the splice acceptor of exon 23 with indels using CRISPR-Cas9. We hypothesized that indels in the splice acceptor would result in exclusion of this exon during mRNA processing. 
And that is indeed what we saw. Of note for the strategy of, of skipping of a single exon to be viable, that exon needs to be symmetric, which means it needs to contain a multiple of three nucleotides so as not to create a frame shift. Also for it to be a viable therapeutic strategy, removal of that exon should result in a protein that still has some function either with or without uh, pharmacological modulation. We were able to use a, um, a good uh, guide RNA target with a predicted cut site directly adjacent to the exon 23 splice acceptor. And again, we were doing this with um, a CRISPR-Cas approach in genomic DNA. We delivered the gene editing reagents as an RNP complex composed of Cas9 complex with the guide RNA to CFF16HBE GE CFTR1282X cells. We single cell clone these cells using FACs and then uh, split single cell clones into two plates. We isolated mRNA from the clones and did a qPCR screen to distinguish between exon 23 inclusion and exon 23 exclusion. Uh, from the second plate, we expanded and characterized clonal cell lines that had efficient exon 23 skipping. This graph shows CFTR exon coverage by long read next generation sequencing analysis of CFTR mRNA. Shown on the x-axis are the 27 exons of CFTR. Shown on the y-axis is the normalized, uh, normalized count. So I think it's pretty obvious here that there is a, a dramatic drop in exon 23 coverage in the three uh, exon 23 skipping clones that are shown here in blue, green, and purple. This is in contrast to wild type, which is shown in black, and 1282X, which is shown in gray. Quantitatively, we achieved 94 to 99% loss of exon 23 coverage in these three skipped lines. This indicates that the targeted genomic disruption of the exon 23 splice acceptor resulted in really robust exon skipping in these three clonal cell lines. And this makes this a very robust model to be able to analyze the functional consequences of exon 23 skipping. And that's what we did. So shown in this slide are electro is electrophysiology data from a TEC24 assay. On the top row, um, a DMSO treatment, and in the bottom row is 24-hour treatment with VX661 and VX445. VX770 was added acutely in this assay. 16HBE 14O minus cells that express wild type CFTR have the characteristic profile. As expected, 16HBE GE cells expressing 1282X CFTR have little to no CFTR function either in the DMSO or in the modulator treatment. There are three exon 23 skipped clones shown here. In the DMSO condition, they have 0 to 2% of wild type function. However, excitingly, when treated 24 hours with VX661 and VX445 and acutely with 770, this could be boosted to about 15% of wild type function. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about exon 24 skipping. So, and, and this was done in the context of N1303K. N1303K is not a CFTR PTC, but it is another rare mutation for which there is not currently a therapeutic that treats the basic defect. We were excited by the results of the exon 23 skipping uh, data, and um, both exons 23 and 24 uh, encode portions of CFTR NBD2. The design for this was a little bit different. Due to, to sequence constraints and kind of non-ideal sequences for targeting, we did not target the exon 24 uh, splice acceptor. Instead, we targeted a predicted exonic splice enhancer, or ESE, actually located within the sequence of exon 24 itself. Um, as you'll see, we were able to achieve robust levels of exon skipping with this approach as well. I'm briefly going to go through the methods for this. Um, they were very similar to what was done for exon 23, but again, now we are delivering um, to CFF 16HBE GE CFTR N1303K cells because N1303K is located in exon 24. And again, we expanded and characterized clonal cell lines with efficient exon 24 skipping. This is the long read next generation sequencing analysis of the CFTR mRNA for the exon 24 skipped clones. Again, the 27 exons of CFTR are located on the x-axis and the normalized exon count is located on the y-axis. 
we were able to achieve 98 to 99 percent loss of exon 24 coverage in these three exon 24 skipped lines in contrast to N1303K shown in gray and wild type shown in black. This indicates that targeted genomic disruption of the exon 24 putative exonic splice enhancer resulted in really robust exon skipping in these three lines and that this makes it a robust model in which to evaluate the functional consequences of exon 24 skipping. This is the electrophysiology data for the exon 24 skipping. The setup is uh, similar. So DMSO is shown in the top row. Uh, VX661 and VX445 treatment is shown in the bottom row. The 16HBE, GE, and 1303K cells, as expected, had little to no function in the DMSO condition. However, um, CFTR function was boosted when treated with modulators. The three exon 24 skipped clones shown here also had little to no function in the DMSO condition and could also be boosted um, a little bit with CFTR modulators. However, the amount of CFTR function that was achieved from the exon 24 skipped clones did not exceed that from what was achieved with the N1303K clones, indicating that exon 24 skipping did not provide additional benefit. So, in conclusion, we were able to achieve robust exon 23 skipping using genomic targeting of the exon 23 splice acceptor. 16 HBE GE 1282X exon 23 skipped clones had only 0 to 2% of wild type function, but excitingly, this could be boosted to about 15% when treated with CFTR modulators. We think that this data suggests that exon 23 skipping could be a viable uh, strategy for people with CFTR 1282X, but that beneficial amounts of wild type CFTR function would likely require the co-treatment with CFTR modulators. I also think that it's worth noting that in the CFTR2 database, there are at least 14 additional rare or ultra rare mutations that are located within exon 23. While we did not test that specifically, we were focused on 1282X. Uh, it's a reasonable hypothesis that um, people with CF with other mutations in exon 23 may also benefit from this approach. 16-HBE cells, which we initially evaluated this in, do not express CFTR in a polarized fashion. So similar exon skipping efficacy may actually lead to greater functional rescue in a polarized epithelium. The story for exon 24 skipping is a little bit different. Um, robust exon 24 skipping was achieved using genomic targeting of the exon 24 putative exonic splice enhancer. And the exon 24 skipped clones did not exhibit an increase in CFTR function compared to N1303K cells. However, CFTR modulators were able to induce a modest increase in CFTR function in the 16HBE, GE, and 1303K cells, as well as in the exon 24 skipped cells. This particular data does not support exon 24 skipping as a potential therapeutic strategy. So with that, I would like to thank all of the people involved in this work, um, especially Kath Bukas, who's a very talented research associate on my team who did the genomic editing for this project and some of the characterization as well. Emily, Josh, Norm, and Andre did the next generation sequencing and bioinformatics work to determine the percent of exon skipping that was achieved. Uh, Yi, um, Kevin, and Herman were all involved in the electrophysiology work to determine um, the amount of CFTR function from these clones, and uh, leadership and direction for, for this project were provided by Martin Mentz. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, so we have a, a good number of questions here for you. So. Uh, the first one, is your editing allele specific? And how would you expect uh, these sort of exon skipping approaches to affect a compound heterozygote? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, in this particular approach, it was not allele specific. So this was done in uh, home size cells that are homozygous for the particular mutation. Um, it may be feasible in like an ASO approach to have some specific targeting for the given mutation um, based upon kind of how far the targeting is, um, the targeted sequence is away from the mutation or, or if those can be kind of combined in a single oligo or something like that. So I think it's possible to envision um, an allele specific approach, um, but that was not done in this proof of concept, which was, was really on a genomic level. Um. A, a question, I guess, summarizing from a few different people here. Uh, 
it seems that removal of the entire Exxon, especially Exxon 24, uh, may be detrimental. Are there any other exons that are dispensable for um, for CFTR function, uh, in, in particular uh, between exon twenty three and twenty seven? Yeah, so um, it depends a bit on the approach. Um, so I'd have to go back and look, but I have a list of basically which exons are symmetric um, for all of the CFTR exons. And so if you're going to target a single exon for exon skipping, um, many exons are not. Uh, compatible with that approach just based upon the number of nucleotides that they have. Um, if you wanted to target sort of multiple exons simultaneously in order to end up with something that wasn't a frame shift, um, that is potentially possible, although a little more complicated. Um, and I'd have to think about kind of which combinations of exons would be sort of viable there. Um, we did not specifically test uh, other exons in terms of what they would produce in terms of a functional protein, but that's something that could be done. And I, for many, many um, of the exons in CFTR are not symmetric. And so they would need to be sort of combined with the, the skipping of additional exons and, and things get a little more complicated there. But there may be other exons in CFTR that could be skipped as a single exon. And, and we did not sort of comprehensively evaluate that. Um, let's see, the, the next question, do we have a sense for the efficiency of gene editing uh, in a non-coding region versus a coding region, uh, was efficiency measured as part of the line selection? So, so that's a good question. Um, efficiency was not measured as part of the line selection. We were interested in obtaining kind of a really pure system um, and achieving very high levels of exon skipping. And so in order to do that, we isolated clones that achieved very high levels of exon skipping as opposed to working in a pool of cells. Um, it's certainly something that could be done. Um, that was not the focus of this work. And so we did not evaluate um, the percent editing um, because that sort of this editing approach is not, not a, a therapeutic editing approach. It was a proof of concept. And so we wanted to achieve maximum um, editing, and we're able to do that um, by looking in clonal cell lines. Um, I see that there is a comment from uh, one of your co-authors that uh, is emphasizing the same point that um, this is uh, a proof of concept to establish um, uh, that this approach could work. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. So with that in mind, could you speculate how you could um, use exon skipping as an approach in in the in the whole person or whole animal as the next step what um what are you thinking about rather than using say a gene editing approach what other methods would you try yeah so um as i mentioned in the introduction this was really a, a proof of concept study aimed at evaluating whether or not exon skipping of exons 23 or 24 was a, a potentially viable therapeutic approach um, clinically, exon skipping has been achieved with antisense oligonucleotides, and so I think that that would be the clinical approach here. I think that's quite straightforward. Um, and so that's what I mean by you could potentially design an ASO that would be specific to the mutation um, or allele specific. Um, and so I, I think development of, of ASOs would be likely the, the clinical path forward in particular for exon 23 skipping. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And I... Uh, Thank you for, uh, for all those uh, uh, insights. Uh, we'll next move to um, Dr. Carlos Gustavo Perez Garcia from Arcturus Therapeutics, who will talk about um, lunar CF and aerosolized mRNA replacement therapy for CF lung disease. Well, thank you so much to the organization for inviting Arturus Therapeutics to introduce our Lunar CF program, an aerosolized mRNA replacement therapy for CC fibrosis lung disease. Those are the four looking statements for Arturus Therapeutics, and uh, I, those are my disclosures. Lunar CF is an uh, mRNA replacement therapy that it's meant to treat the underlying cause of the CC fibrosis lung disease. It's a therapeutic approach that it will be patient agnostic. And the main idea behind that is to replace the defective of non-existent copy of CFTR in CF patients. For that, what we'll do is to introduce a healthy copy of the human CFTR mRNA we will, uh, that will codify for a natural human CFTR protein 
The mRNA will be encapsulated in uh, our lunar formulations. Lunar are a lipid nanoparticles. It's a lipid nanoparticle delivery platform. And the idea is that the patient will um, we will put the, the lunar formulations carrying the human CSTR mRNA in a nebulizer that we inhale it and the aerosol will be delivered directly into the epithelial airways and hopefully will bring some benefit in terms of mucosal cleanse and quality of life. Lunar formulations uh, for this program are highly breathable. And as you can see here on the left panels, we want to make sure that the droplet size that we are generated, once we generate the aerosol of our lunar human CFTR mRNAs is within the breathable range, which is normally for lung therapy is between one and five. We, we get usually between two and three microns of droplet size, which uh, means that our lunar formulations are highly breathable and they're optimal for lung therapeutics. One of the things that we also wanted to make sure is that um, the physical chemical properties and the activity of the cargo mRNA and the lunar itself carrying the, uh, the human CSTR mRNA uh, are maintained uh, once we generate the aerosol. If you think about it, we start with a liquid formulation. We put it in the nebulizer and we generate an aerosol. This is a quick uh, change of the stage from a liquid into an aerosol. So we need to make sure that the cargo mRNA, the, the lunar nanoparticle is not compromised when we generate the aerosol. And here what we did is that we, um, we made EGFP mRNA, we encapsulated in our lunar formulations and we uh, put it in the uh, nebulizer and we collect the aerosolization fraction and we put it in a cell-based assay um, together with a pre-nebulization fraction. And then we'll look for the expression of EGFP. As you can see in both pre and post nebulization fractions, we do see EGFP expression that tells us that our lunar formulations and the car mRNA is not compromised. Uh, uh, as an aerosol form. And the third uh, point I want to make here is that uh, we need to make sure that we are actually delivering into the right structures in the animal. So what we did here is we generate luciferous mRNA, we encapsulate it in our lunar formulations, and we deliver it into the rats using a nose-only exposure system. Here you have PBS and the treated animals. What we did is we used the IV system to look for where the luminescence is in the animal. And as you can see, as expected, we do see high luminescence in the lawn and also in the nose since the rats are obligated nose breeders. In terms of the drug substance, we do uh, quite, we do an extensive codom optimization uh, approach uh, through the different programs we have gone through uh, uh, our tourist therapeutics, we have learned quite a lot in terms of the different uh, strategies to optimize uh, mRNAs. And uh, we have uh, proprietary algorithms that we use in each one of those programs. And here you have an example using four different approaches of uh, column optimization for human CFTR mRNA. COM7, 8, 2, and 9. What we did is that we transfected into CFB cells uh, together with COM1. COM1 is a non codom optimized human CFTR mRNA. And as you can see, once we collect the protein lysis and we run a Western blood and we use a CFTR specific antibody, we do see a, a CFTR expression at the spectra size for the C band. And you can see all the codom optimized sequences express higher levels of proteins when compared with the non codom optimized sequence. And here you have the quantitation. On the right side, you have some POC that is trying to show that our human CFTR mRNA is not only produce the CFTR protein, but it's also fully glycosylated. So what we did is uh, some transfections in CFB cells with the, uh, some of the codon optimized uh, mRNAs, as you can see here, and we used some untransfected cell control. Then we did some membrane fraction to make sure that what we are detecting uh, is in the membrane fraction. And then uh, we, what we did is we run a Western blood and we use a CFTR specific antibody. And as you can see, we do see very beautiful C band, some B band. What we did is that we use those fractions and we do we did a deglycosylation assay to make sure that all the glycosylation that is part of the um, the functional protein uh, is no longer existent. And as you can see, all the C and B band once we deglycosylate it, it's uh, it's no longer present in the deglycosylated fraction where we do see an enrichment uh, A band uh, as expected. In terms of efficacy, as you might all be aware, it's, it's a, a little bit tricky to determine uh, efficacy in the lung. Uh, 
uh, in a proclinical model, we, we still do not have the tool fully developed, but we have done quite uh, a lot of uh, different approaches uh, from an in vitro perspective on the left and from an in vivo perspective on the right. Uh, let's start with the in vitro side. Uh, here you have some uh, studies that we did with Robert Bridges at uh, Rosalind Franklin um, University. And the main goal from those studies, and, and the question that we uh, were asked ourselves is that, do the quantum opti optimized human CSTR mRNAs, are they efficacious when we put it into a polarized system? So what we did is test it in an FRT cells using an air liquid interface and um, you can see here, uh, compare with the natural sequence. Remember the natural sequence that we, have, we use as a control is a non quantum optimized sequence. When, once we add the first calling and then we add the BX770, we do see uh, an increase in transepithelial conductance that is in some of those quantum optimized mRNAs up to threefold uh, compared to the natural sequence. That tells us that our, our mRNAs are efficacious, at least in an in vitro setting. The logical path for us was to test it in an in vivo uh, model. And here you have some of the work that we have been doing with uh, Craig Hodges at Case Western University. This is just one example of multiple studies that we have done using uh, nasal potential difference. And here what we did is uh, we used a class one CFTR knockout mass model to deliver our lunar formulation uh, carrying a human CFTR mRNA. When then we use controls uh, of a TD tomato mRNA as a control mRNA encapsulated in lunar and also PBS, and then we measure nasal potential difference. And as you can see, we do see a significant uh, increase in current uh, observed only in the groups that has encapsulated human CFTR mRNA. We do not see uh, in the controls. And this is something that we do see consistently in every single study that we do using nasal potential difference, where only the human CFTR encapsulated uh, a group uh, give us uh, efficacy. Of course, the next path for us is, uh, is to try to generate POC in terms of delivery. And one of the main problems in, in general in, in any therapeutic approach, and particularly for, for um, uh, long therapeutics, is uh, the delivery. And I think the lunar uh, helps on that. And here you have some um, delivery approaches that we have done in the rodent models. Here we have an ABC, the mice model, DEF, the rat model. What we did is that we deliver lunar uh, tea tomato, tea tomato mRNA encapsulated in lunar formulations. We deliver it into the airways of the mouse and uh, into the rat. And as you can see uh, by checking immunohistochemistry on the lungs that were dissected out from those animals, uh, as you can see, we do see a very robust expression of TD tomato mRNA uh, in the epithelial airways. So that tells us that uh, lunar formulations can actually derive and deliver and target the cargo mRNA into the epithelial airways. Of course, we wanted to generate more data in non rodent models. So here you have two studies, uh, or two models we have been constantly using, the ferret model uh, and the NHP model. The ferret model, we have done this work with John Engelhardt at the University of Iowa, and those are the panels A, B, C, D. We use the ROSA26 transgenic ferret model that constitutively expressed TD tomato in the airways. But upon Crelox recombination, the TD tomato turns off and allows the expression of EGFP in green. With, with this consideration in mind, what we did is deliver CRE-mRNA encapsulate in our lunar formulations into the airways of the ferrets. And as you can see by the green expression of EGFP, we do see a very robust transduction in the airways. And as here you have some high magnification um, images that we do not see in the control. For the NHP, we did uh, develop the capabilities to do face mask uh, aerosolization in an NHP. What we did is uh, use uh, the reporter gene. We used a T tomato mRNA and being encapsulated in our lunar formulations. We aerosolized it using a face mask in the NHP, and we did a similar exercise. We were looking for uh, expression using immunohistochemistry in the uh, airways of those animals. And here you can see a beautiful protein expression uh, within lining the airways within the trachea level and also at the lung levels. And as you can see, very beautiful ciliated cells here that we do not see in the controls. That tells us that Lunar is a very efficient platform to deliver a cargo mRNA that seems to work perfectly across pieces and it seems to be a good approach for 
any land fair politics. The next question that we we're wondering is that, okay, we know that we target epithelial airways, but are we targeting the right cells? And through this conference, there have been a lot of uh, conversations between the, the colleagues about uh, what are the relevant cells that we need to target, our ciliated cells, our ionocytes, our secretory cells. So we are generating um, um, this data, we're self-profiling uh, the delivery of our lunar formulations and which cells are we getting into. And here you have just an example um, uh, of delivery of uptake insulated cells. We use it in two models, uh, the rodent in panel A and the ferret in panel B. In panel L, we use the flock CD tomato mice. And what we did is uh, um, deliver pre mRNA encapsulated in lunar and apple, the cells that uptake the CRE will produce the uh, cre luxal combination. And then you will see a beautiful expression of CD tomato that you can use it to co-localize with ciliated specific markers like Fox J1. And as you can see, we do see a, a very beautiful co-localization profile in rodents. That is something that we do also see in the ferrets. And the first, we use the ROSA 26 transgenic mice. And here is EGFP in green, what is going to guide you on the cells that have uptake the formulations. And when you do colocalize with acetylated alpha tubulin, which is another marker for ciliated cells, you do see a very robust colocalization uh, in, in, in ciliated cells. So uh, in general, and the take home message for everybody is that uh, our true therapeutics is developing an mRNA replacement therapy uh, to treat uh, cystic fibrosis lung disease. Uh, our lunar formulations, our formulations are highly breathable and optimal for lung delivery. Cotton optimization offers an advantage to express higher protein levels that are biologically active. Lunar formulation, as uh, have seen, I have shown here, uh, can efficiently deliver uh, to epithelial airways uh, across species, and lunar can selectively deliver to epithelial cells. You can modulate the formulations to target specific cell types. And with that, I would like to thank to everybody involved in Arturo Therapeutics to put together uh, all this team for the last three years. And in particular, I would like to thank our collaborators, John Engelhardt and Xiaomi Liu at the University of Iowa, Susan Burkett and the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Craig Hodges at Case Western, Robert Bridges at Rosalind Franklin University, and Martin Mans, and in particular, Kevin and Herman for the great work uh, at the CC Fibrosis Foundation. And of course, the, the, the constant support for the CC Fibrosis Foundation and the beliefs on, on this program are, are also uh, highly appreciated. And now I would like to take any question if um, there's some. All right, uh, thank you very much. We have some questions. So uh, first, uh, this is a product that you might anticipate you need to deliver repeatedly to people with, with CF. Um, did you observe any evidence of immunogenicity of your uh, delivery vector uh, or decreasing efficacy with uh, repeated dosing challenges? Yeah, in terms of uh, repeat dose, we, we still, or toxicity, we still haven't started our toxicology studies. What can speak up is what we have observed in uh, pharmacology studies. And we have not observed any, uh, any potential issue in terms of a single dose on the, the very little repeat dose we have done. The animal seems to tolerate the formulations well. Uh, in terms of the histology of the lungs, it looks totally normal comparable to the control, but it is until we start the talk studies uh, when we will be able to uh, fully address those questions. Um, a related question is, did you look for evidence of antibodies against the human CFTR um, transgene in your animal models? Not yet. We haven't done those studies yet. We have planned uh, on doing that, but we haven't had the, the, the bandwidth yet, but uh, it's something that we are, we are, we're planning to. Um, have you, have you seen uh, evidence of expression of, of your transgenes and non-ciliated cell types? Um, for instance, basal cells, goblet cells, ionocytes, well, we, we are working on the ionocytes with, uh, with John on, on, on that. Uh, the problem with the ionocytes is that they're, they're very hard to find. Yes. Uh, so then we are working on that. We are looking into that. In terms of the basal cells, we don't know yet. And we're actually very interested on uh, seeing some delivery in the submucosal glands. And we are also something that we are looking into. But it's still... Uh, uh, those are studies that are still ongoing and, and planning. Hopefully, uh, 
in, in a couple of months, we can address most of those. Um, it, RNA is a, a short-lived uh, molecule. Um, are you making any efforts to uh, um, chemically modify the RNA to make it long lasting so that the, uh, the person receiving it could re receive doses only once in a while? Yeah, all our uh, mRNAs are chemically modified. We do use chemically modified uh, uridines. There's a lot of evidence showing that there's a, there's a therapeutic benefit on that because you reduce the immunogenicity. Uh, some uh, chemically modified uridines uh, offer some um, um, advantage in terms of flexibility of the mRNA that make it easy for the ribosome. So mRNA stability is something that is improved with chemically modified as uh, uridines, but yes, we, we use uh, chemical modifier in all our shipments. All right, um, there's a, a comment. Uh, it sounds as if you are not targeting um, the cells in regards to CFTR expression uh, in uh, that you're hitting ciliated cells and not the ionocytes or secretory cells. We do not know yet if we target ionocyte. It's very hard uh, to find the cells that we have ongoing efforts to, to address the questions. And based on the data that we have generated, for example, in rodent, uh, we, we, we target secretory cells. We're trying to generate this data in the, in the NHP uh, and hopefully we can get a full cell profiling of where our formulations are getting in the different models. And, and hopefully we can, we can show that uh, anytime soon. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for giving such excellent talks today and answering uh, our rapid fire questions. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you to you guys for the organization.